All right. Uh, any questions from the last time that we met and gathered here in this room? Fantastic. All right. So we're going to finish up talking about kinetics here. So we talked about our absorption. We talked about distribution. We talked about metabolism. Anyone remember what the, the main enzyme system that we care about for metabolism? Cytochrome P450. Absolutely. Right. What was the, the main really important one out of that group? 3A4. 3A4 is like the really big one, right? Because it metabolizes so many different drugs, causes so many interactions. Don't you worry. I will drill that into your malleable minds before this year is done. So fret not. Anyway, uh, so we went through metabolism. Now we're getting into the excretion. How do we get rid of the drugs? Um, we talked about the kidneys being a really important place for that uh, elimination to occur. We talked about the biliary tract being another one. Um, we were discussing renal function, right? How do we determine how uh, well someone's kidneys are working? We can look at things like urine output. We talked about that. We can also look at things like our serum creatinine and using that as that surrogate marker, right? Because we don't want to have, have our patients carry around a bucket for 24 hours, having to collect all that urine to see how much creatinine they pass. Let's use what's in the blood. And we said that the lower our serum creatinine is, what does that tell us about renal function? Better being cleared means the better the function of the kidneys are, right? If it is uh, serum creatinine is higher, usually means what? Usually function is lower, means you're not able to get rid of it, right? Um, also keep in mind that like you know people with very different body habits is, and that can influence this pretty directly, right? So if you had someone like a bodybuilder, what do you think their serum creatinine would be? Higher or lower? Probably higher, right? They have more muscle to break down in order to pass through the urine, right? If you had someone who's an amputee, what about that? That should be lower, right? It has nothing to do with their actual kidney function per se. It just has to do with how much creatinine they can actually produce. You have to be careful with that, right? Uh, what kind of patients do you think might be more prone to getting an amputation? Diabetics. Diabetics, right? You worry about the diabetic foot infections and they lop off the leg. You know, you have to consider, you know, other complications of diabetes includes the nephropathy, right? So, you know, their renal function is going to go down. If you have someone who has a below the knee amputation, they're producing less creatinine. What would that do to their creatinine clearance? Would it falsely elevate it or lower it? actually falsely elevate the creatinine clearance because remember serum creatinine is in that denominator there. So by uh, falsely elevating it, you think, oh, the renal function looks pretty good. I'm going to dose a drug like this when really you should be dosing it less frequently or at a lower dose because you know their kidneys are bad because they're diabetics. Again, we'll cover and go through all that stuff and those considerations there. But these are things you're going to be thinking about, right? Anyway, just remember there's other uh, uh, formulas out there depending on the age group that you're dealing with, pediatrics, elderly, Etc. Right? But I want you to know how the variables are actually going to be factoring into this. So the older a person gets, and the higher their serum creatinine is, typically the worse off their kidney function is. Right? Okay. Um, let's look at some other cases here. So, uh, or um, in another situation I can think of, you know, when someone's creatinine might be falsely elevated. Imagine uh, when you have someone who's first born, say in the first few days of life. Why do you think an infant's uh, or neonate's uh, creatinine will be higher than it should be normally. What do you think that might be? Huh? No, they don't really have a ton of muscle to actually produce a lot of creatinine. But whose creatinine do you think you're measuring? Oh, you're actually measuring the mom's creatinine, right? So there are different situations we'll learn about where that can actually be falsely elevated or lowered, and that factors into um, determining kind of how we're going to dose our drugs based off that renal function there. Typically for uh, you know, males and females, around 100 mLs per minute is typically pretty normal in terms of creatinine clearance. And when you're looking at drug dosing, you'll see there's a whole section on there typically for uh, different drugs about how to dose in renal dysfunction. So that way, you know, if it says, okay, well, the renal function is between 50 and 80, you dose it like this. If it's between 20 and 50, you dose it like this. And you need to make sure you're, you're addressing that, especially if changes happen, right? So whether you're in the ICU and the changes could be daily, or if you're do dosing someone over a long period of time, like you have to readdress that renal function to make sure you're adjusting doses as needed. Now, does every drug have to be renally adjusted, do you think? No, it really depends, right? Some drugs undergo almost no renal elimination. They only get uh, metabolized to the liver and then pass to the biliary tract. Uh, some drugs only go through renal elimination and they have to really be adjusted. So, uh, again, it's going to be very drug dependent, as you will see. So um, as we mentioned, clearance and that volume distribution helps us to determine what our half-life is. Half-life is just what? Yeah, how long it takes to eliminate half the drug in the body, right? We mentioned that can be very variable depending on the drug there. Why does volume distribution have an impact on the half-life, do you think? 
Yeah, so think about volume distribution is telling us how distributed that drug is out to the tissues there. And so if it's in the tissues, not in the bloodstream, it can't get to the kidneys or it can't get to the liver in order to be metabolized or eliminated. So that's why volume distribution, the higher that is, typically that means you're going to have a longer half-life, okay? So imagine if you have like a really water-soluble drug and I had someone who developed edema, you can find that that drug will then partition out to that water and what's going to happen to the half-life of that drug? It'll actually increase, right? Because again, it's not in the blood to get eliminated through the kidneys. So in those cases there, you can find that, oh, I may need to actually dose this drug less frequently because I know it's sticking around for longer. And if I don't do that, then I may see more toxicities potentially, right? So that's really important to consider there. Um, and so again, this helps us to determine what our steady state plasma levels is. Now, when I say steady state, anyone know what that means? It's an equilibrium essentially, right? So that way, uh, for a given period of time, say 24 hours, the amount of drug I'm putting into the system is equal to the amount of drug I'm getting out of the system, right? With every drug, as long as you're dosing it the same, same dose and same interval, at some point you're going to hit an equilibrium, okay? And so we'll talk more about that uh, more specifically. Now getting into elimination, there's going to be two varieties here we'll talk about. There's first order and zero order elimination. The majority of drugs we're going to talk about is going to be first order eliminations, whether that's going to be... Um, referencing there. But essentially when I say first order, and there's some graphs I'll show you that will, will illustrate this as well. First order means you're eliminating a constant percentage of drug per unit of time. Okay, so that means say for a given hour, you're going to metabolize 15% of a drug. So that first hour you metabolize 15% of whatever's there. The next hour you're going to do 15% of whatever's left. The next hour 15% of whatever's left and so on and so forth. So you have no drug left over. Okay, this means that as the drug concentration increases, you're also metabolizing more drug. It's always the same percentage though, right? So the actual base amount. And again, some graphs will help uh, illustrate this a little bit better. Most drugs follow that. Zero order kinetics are gonna be when you end up saturating your enzyme systems or you end up saturating the processes that allow you to eliminate that drug. And so that's why I call it capacity limited. And this gets to the point where you can only metabolize a certain amount of drug per unit of time. So again, using ethanol as my example here, most people, most alcohol naive patients, you'll find um, that they on average will metabolize 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Doesn't matter if your alcohol level is 500, or if it's 100, you're always going to metabolize 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour. So that's why you have people who um, potentially have massive alcohol ingestions. They can be drunk for a really long time because you oversaturate the enzymes in the liver, and it just takes them a long time to metabolize all that, all that alcohol off. And again, let me show you these graphs here, and that will be clear. If you were to plot the drug concentration versus time, you can see here that for zero order connects, it's going to be a straight line there, right? So you're going to find it's a straight line because it's always the same amount of drug. For alcohol, it's 20 milligrams per deciliter, 20 milligrams per deciliter every hour. For first order kinetics, you're going to find there's more of a ramp to it, right? You're going to find that it's going to be, um, you know, a very steep slope in the very beginning, and then it kind of peters out here. But it's always the same percentage of the uh, drug being metabolized for that given unit of time, okay? You know, why in the heck do I care about this? It's really important because this is going to help us to determine what our steady state is or kind of what, where that equilibrium point is to make sure that we're getting levels up high enough to where we're actually treating the patient for whatever the disease state is. And we're also not getting so high in the levels that we're causing toxicity there. We have to hit that, that Goldilocks sort of zone for a lot of these drugs here. But getting into this, uh, looking at um, the clearance here, and specifically we're talking about first order for the most part. Um, looking at this, you're going to find that the concentration of the drug and the rate of drug administration is going to be determining our clearance here, right? So this means when you look at clearance, CL, is going to be equal to the rate of drug administration in, okay, over the drug concentration. So obviously, if I'm not clearing the drug from the body, say I have poor kidney function, the concentration is going to go up. And what does that mean for clearance? Clearance is down, right? Because I can't clear it fast enough so that all the drugs left over in the blood that I'm measuring, okay? Or if I put in more drug into the system, what is that going to do to my clearance? It's always going to metabolize more drug as, as I put more in because, again, it's first order connects. It's always the same percentage there, and that will make sense in a few minutes here. But when I look at the rate of drug administration, another way I can look at that is also going to be the dose that I'm uh, in, introducing into the system and the interval. Now, when I say interval, what does that mean? How frequently I'm giving it, right? So how frequently do we give drugs? I guess it depends is a good answer there. Fantastic. In fact, you can probably use that for any question I ask. It depends. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, more specifically, though, it, it can range, right? It can be a continuous infusion that I'm giving to a patient, right? I hook them up to an IV and just let it run continuously. What's the downside of doing that? 
kind of cumbersome, right? You ever see like patients walking through the halls with their IV poles attached? So that's a continuous infusion. It's not really practical, especially for outpatient purposes. Um, but I can give drugs intermittently, right? Intermittent just means I'm giving it every once in a while, which means I could do it Q24 hours. I could do it Q30 minutes. I could do it uh, Q8 hours. It just depends on how you want to actually dose that medication there. So that's the interval that we're talking about. And typically what you're going to find is that longer intervals give your body more time to metabolize that drug. Shorter intervals, you're going to see that those levels will start to stack up and that'll make more sense here in just a few minutes. But there's always going to be that proportional relationship between the concentration and then the amount of drugs being cleared per unit of time. So to make sense of that a little bit better, imagine here that I were to administer a uh, thousand milligrams of a, of a drug, right? And then mention, you know, we'll just say it's IV. So that way my, bi my bioavailability is what? 100%, right? IV is always going to be 100%. So let's say that for the amount of drug per unit of time being metabolized, it's always going to be 15% in this example here, right? So if you look here, the first hour, 15% of that drug is going to get metabolized, okay? So and this means that 15% of 1,000 means I'm going to have 850 milligrams of drug floating around the body left over. 150 of it has been eliminated, okay? Now the next hour, what happens? Okay, well, I have less drugs starting out with, but it's always going to be 15% as it gets metabolized. So now I have 723 available. The amount eliminated has also gone down a little bit as well. So again, the proportion is always going to be the same here because I haven't saturated those enzyme systems yet. Now, what if I put 2,000 milligrams into the system? How much do you get metabolized that first hour? 300 milligrams, right? Because again, it's always going to be that same 15%. Does that make sense for everyone? So again, that remains constant. And that's important because knowing that it's constant like that, we can start to do calculations to figure out, okay, well, how much do I need to give this patient? How often do I need to give it, et cetera? And I'll go into detail on that. I know 15 is just an example, but like, is it like actually per hour or is it just like help us mentally grasp? Because it feels like 15% it would like really not go away very fast. Well, the, yeah, so uh, this is just uh, an example just to illustrate the point. But, yeah, depending on the drug, you know, you'll see that some drugs can have a half-life of, say, 10 seconds. Some of them can have half-lives of many weeks, potentially, right? So, again, um, that this fraction here, though, this 15%, uh, there's actually a variable for that. It's called KE, and I have this on another slide. Uh, and that can range greatly depending on the drug and also on the patient, right? So, for instance, someone has poor kidney function, that 15% may go down to, say, only 8, Right? Or if they have really good kidney function, maybe it goes up to, say, 25. Or, say, their enzymes change, and it can also range as well, right? So, again, this, will, this is going to be very patient-specific and drug-specific, as we'll see. So, another way to look at this, if you're looking at first-order kinetics, remember that uh, drug concentrations here on the uh, y-axis here are going to have time, or half-lives, in this case, here on the, the x-axis. Again, note here that it's always going to be the same percentage of drug. And, again, the half-life is just going to be what percentage of drug being metabolized? 50%, right? Half-life's always 50% anyway. So you're going to see here, again, it's always going to be proportional, okay? Always the same proportion per whatever unit of time you're looking at, okay? So that fraction that we mentioned here is also called KE. And again, I'm not going to get super deep on the math. Like, I'm not going to have you do, like, natural logarithms in your head for the test. I tried that one year. It didn't go well. My eval suffered for it. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. But... Um, Basically, what you're looking at is, and we, and we actually do these calculations in real life, like when we're actually dosing patients for certain antibiotics, we do this pretty frequently. And so actually how we determine what that fraction is, is by looking at the slope of the line, okay? So we're going to take that concentration, and we're going to turn it into a logarithm, so it actually it will straighten out that curvy line we saw on the last slide. And so by looking at that, we can actually take the difference between two levels, right? We can take a peak level, and then we can take a trough level. Peak meaning what? The highest point it gets to, and then a trough being the lowest point, right? And then by comparing those two and knowing what that delta of time was, what that change in time was, whether it was one hour or 12 hours, I can then figure out, well, how fast am I metabolizing this drug and get that fraction down, right? Whether it's 15%, 85%, 1%, whatever the case may be, this is how I figure that out. And again, going into how do you calculate that KE, another way to look at it is actually that clearance divided by the VD. So again, if VD is high, what does that do to my KE? It lowers it, right? Which makes sense. We just said the higher the volume distribution is, the harder it is for the drug to get to the bloodstream to get eliminated. So that's going to slow down my metabolism and elimination. If clearance goes up, what does that do to my KE? It's going to increase as well, which means I'm getting rid of the drug more quickly. Okay, so again, intuitively, a lot of this stuff will make sense if you kind of think through it a few times. And again, don't get bogged down by the math. This is just how we come up with these numbers here. The concepts are what I'm really trying to drive home for you. So, again, half-life, the time it takes for that concentration to drop by half. Let's say, for instance, we have drug A, and we measure a concentration, say, at 4 p.m., and it comes back at 20 micrograms per ml. And then I measure another level at 8 p.m., 
and the concentration is 10 micrograms per ml, what's the half-life? Four hours. Pretty straightforward, right? Again, it could get a little more complicated if you're using actual real-life numbers here, but it can be just as simple as that, potentially. Now, what if I had drug B here? I do a uh, level at 8 a.m., that was 40 micrograms per ml, and then I check another concentration at 4 p.m. How many hours have passed? Eight. Eight hours, and now the concentration is 10. How many half-lives have passed? Two, Two half-lives, and what's the half-life? Four hours. Four hours, right? So from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., what was... The concentration now, what do you think the concentration was at 12? It was actually 20 micrograms per ml, and then at 4 p.m., another half life has occurred, so half of that drug is gone. Now you're at 10. So, again, the half lives between these two examples are exactly the same, right? So, it's still four hours. Now, again, I could ask you simple math like that on the test, and I could say, hey, that drug concentration is this at this time, and then it turned out to be this at this time. What's the half life of the drug? And you should be able to figure that out. It's pretty straightforward. So, I'm not going to give you logarithms to figure out, but simple math, I think you should be able to do, right? I'm not getting a lot of nods, so you will be able to do that. Otherwise, we'll have a talk, right? Okay. <laughs> but again, each half-life, 50% of that drug is going to be gone until eventually there's going to be almost no, no drug right, left. So you have basically zero uh, at a certain point here. Yeah. So as I mentioned, very variable depending on the drug you're dealing with. So adenosine, anyone ever heard of the drug adenosine before? Anyone know, know what we use it for? Yes, yeah, supraventricular tachycardia. So if you have someone who has a heart rate of, say, 160, 180, there's tacking away, I can give this to them. Anyone know what this does to the heart? Stops it. Actually, it completely stops it, right? It doesn't just slow it down. It goes to zero, right? So actually, what's really cool if you ever give this drug, um, you put them on a continuous EKG, you see them just tack, 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 tacking away, and then you give them the drug, you push it really fast, and I have to push it fast because the half life's less than 10 seconds, and then all of a sudden, you'll see basically it looks like a tiny bit of time where it flatlines, Everyone holds their breath, and then hopefully goes back into sinus rhythm. <laughs> very exciting, very good to see. You. I know medicine is pretty awesome as it turns out. So, but we have to push it very quickly because the half-life of adenosine is only is less than 10 seconds. So if I'm giving it in a peripheral line, say in the extremity, and I'm just kind of lazily just kind of injecting the drug in, do you think it's ever actually going to get to the heart? No, this is a frequent reason why the drug doesn't work is people don't push it fast enough. You guys basically got to slam that drug in, follow it up with the flush afterwards to get it to the heart to actually work. On the other hand, though, so let's say that adenosine didn't work, patient's still in SVT, I can give them another antiarrhythmic called amiodarone, and this actually has a half-life of 26 to 107 days. Extremely long half-life, right? So again, you're going to find that the longer the half-life is, the longer it's going to take for us to get to a steady state, and we'll kind of talk about that feature a little bit more. But again, there are ways to actually get around that. We'll talk about some ways to do that in a few slides as well. So how do we calculate half-life? Again, I'm not going to have you directly calculate it on, on a test, but just to give you an example how the, the variables factor in here, uh, we'll say that half-life is going to be equal to 0. 0.693 over the KE. The KE we mentioned is what? It's that fraction of drug that gets metabolized per whatever unit of time, usually per hour is how we're going to define that. But it's over that KE. But alternatively, what I can sub in is I can say that, well, since I know that KE is equal to clearance over volume of distribution, by putting this in here, I know that the half-life is going to be equal to this factor here, the 0.693. It's not the important part, but it's equal to that times VD over clearance. Okay, so what does that mean? So if VD is higher, what does that do to my half-life? So in the numerator, it goes up. Right, so as a clearance, that like KE gets lower, half-life actually extends, it gets longer, it takes longer to get rid of that drug. For clearance, as that goes up, what happens to my half-life? Actually, it shrinks, it gets shorter because I'm clearing it faster, so the half-life is going to be shorter, it's going to be much quicker. Okay, so kind of keep those relationships in mind. So, for instance, if I were to say have a patient who develops edema, right, they develop a lot of interstitial fluid buildup, and I have a drug that increases the volume of distribution, what does that do to my half-life? It's going to increase it, right? So now I have to make sure that I'm not giving the drug as frequently. Maybe I have to give it every 24 hours instead of every eight hours, right? As the case may be. We'll see some other examples of that going forward as well. Okay. So as I mentioned, larger VD is going to cause you to have a longer half-life. A smaller clearance is going to do what? Yeah, it's also causing a longer half-life. That makes sense, right? If I shut down your kidneys and you can't get rid of certain drugs that way, obviously it's going to stick around for longer. Half-life is going to be longer, right? So keep these relationships in mind. It's really critical you understand that when you're seeing like, well, why do we give a drug this dose this frequently versus in this situation, this patient, I'm going to give it less frequently or more frequently as the case may be. 
I'll show you some more examples of that in just a little bit as well. But as I mentioned with steady state, that's essentially going to be that equilibrium point where the amount of drug we're putting in is going to be equal to the amount of uh, drug coming out of the, uh, the system essentially. Okay. And so again, we're going to find that clearance is a really big determinant of this. It's going to be helping us to determine where that steady state is going to be. Okay. And so essentially what you're going to find is that at steady state, we're going to have a basically an average concentration the person is going to be at. So as long as you're keeping all variables in line, as long as I keep giving the same dose of drug, the same interval, and the clearance stays the same, the patient's going to have the same average concentration 24-7 essentially, right? And so you can see here that CSS is the average concentration the patient will be at, and this is going to be affected by several things. So for instance, if I give a bigger dose of the drug, what does that do to the average steady state concentration? It's going to go up, right? If I give a lower dose, that's going to go down as well. That makes sense, right? If I give you a bigger dose, you're probably going to have larger concentrations, okay? Um, with clearance, say if clearance goes down, what does that do to my steady state concentration? It goes up as well, right? Because again, the half-life is longer, the drug's sticking around for longer, it's going to not be cleared, concentration goes up. Makes sense. And then also looking at the dosing interval, so if I give a longer dosing interval, say I go from giving it, say, every 8 hours to every 12 hours, what do you think that does to my concentration? Actually, it's going to go down, right? Because I can give the body more time to get rid of that drug. Again, I'll show you some examples and graphs of how it'll make more sense to you when we get to that. But keep these relationships in mind with these, okay? So, um, again, I already kind of went through this. Um, but remember that dosing interval is going to be a really key feature here. Because, again, as clinicians, can I change the clearance of a drug for a patient? No, I can't, unless I like hook them up to dialysis or something like that. But let's say, without going through heroic efforts, let's say, no, I can't really change the clearance. However, can I change the dose I'm giving the patient? Can I change the interval that I'm giving it? 100%, right? So I have control over that. So that's how I have to make sure the patient's in the right sort of steady state concentration by changing those features there. In general, and a good rule of thumb is, um, it takes four to five half-lives for a drug to reach steady state concentration, Okay. Again, when you see the grass, it'll kind of make more sense there. But just in general, keep that relationship in mind. Four to five half-lives is the time it takes to get to steady state. What that looks like, and again, steady state is just the input rate equal to the elimination rate. You're going to find if I were to give a continuous infusion of a medication, so I hook them up to an IV and I just run at one continuous dose. The interval didn't really matter there because, again, it's always continuous. You're going to find that the concentration will start to rise, and then it plateaus out. Now, why do I reach this plateau? It's not saturation necessarily, but it's basically that the amount of drug getting metabolized and eliminated is equal to the amount I'm actually putting into the system. So you're going to reach that steady state point. Now, how could I modify this? How could I change that and make it go up or down? I could give her a bigger dose, right? I can give a faster rate of infusion, so that would cause it to go up higher. Or I can maybe give a smaller dose and make it go down lower, right? Uh, what else could change? What if the patient's clearance changes? Say they go into kidney failure. That would cause the steady state concentration to go up or down. So if kidney function is down, clearance is down, that probably causes the concentration to go higher, right? You're holding on to more of it. You can't get rid of it, so that concentration will go up, okay? Now, again, how many drugs do we give continuous, continuously? Not many, and I'll show you some other ways how this will manifest when using more intermittent sort of dosing here. Now, again, once you hit that point where you stop giving medication here, then it'll tend to drop off pretty precipitously. At that point, you're just metabolizing the drug and getting rid of it, essentially. Okay. So what are some ways we could do this? So let's say we didn't want to give a continuous infusion, and that'll be indicated here by this, by this blue line. What if we were to give... Uh, say the drug intermittently. Let's say I give it every 12 hours or every eight hours, uh, as the case may be. You're going to see that you'll get these peaks and valleys here of the, the drug dosing, right? So again, I give a dose. It's going to go up to a reach a peak level. And then what's happening right here at this point? It's just being eliminated, right? I gave my dose and now the drug is just being eliminated from the body. And so I get to this trough level, right? It's the lowest point before the next dose. And that point I give another dose. Now notice here, I don't let it get all the way to zero, right? Because I want to keep some drug around, right? I want to make sure that the drug is having continuous effect in that patient there to treat their hypertension or their diabetes or whatever. So anyway, so you're going to find it gets to this trough here. And then what do you notice about the next peak? It's higher than what the first one was, right? You're starting to have this dose stacking, right? Because I didn't eliminate all the drug with the first dose. Some of that is still sticking around. So now this peak is a little bit higher. And then what do you notice about this trough? It's a little bit higher than the last one, okay? And then I'm going to dose again and again and again. And by roughly four to five half-lives of that drug, you'll be at that steady state concentration here. Now, again, with the adenosine, say I was given that via continuous infusion, how long would it take me to get to steady state? Four to five half-lives of 10 seconds. Within a minute or so, I should be at, uh, should be at steady state, right? 
I would never do that with that drug, but just to illustrate the point. Now, amiodarone, said, let's say between 20 and 100 days, how long is it going to take me to get to steady state that for that drug? I mean, it could be like a year, right, depending on how fast the patient eliminates it. So, again, it can be extremely variable depending on, on, on the drug you're dealing with there. But, again, this makes sense so far. Again, you're going to see that dose stacking until you get to that steady state point where, again, the average concentration is the same here, even though you're going to be getting these vacillations, these peaks and valleys between the levels. Okay? Now, there's a couple of different ways that I could do this, right? So, I could give a drug less frequently, but what would I need to do the dose to keep the same concentration? I think give a bigger dose. I give a larger doses less frequently, or I could give smaller doses more frequently. And I should still achieve the same average steady state concentration. Okay. So again, this, this line here is going to be the continuous infusion. This lighter line here is going to be if I were giving a smaller dose, but more frequently. And then this larger dose here is going to be, uh, this larger line is going to be a bigger dose, but given less frequently. This one's every 24 hours. This one's every eight or so. Okay, so what do you notice about the kind of comparisons between these two dosing strategies? Yeah, so with the bigger dose less frequently, you're going to find larger peaks and valleys, right? You're going to find there's a lot uh, bigger variation in the concentrations there, okay? And then when you give it more frequently, with a smaller dose, you're going to see a little bit less. It's more tightly controlled there, okay? So why might I choose one versus the other? Hmm? Okay, so which one have better compliance, you think? The larger dose less frequently, good. What are some other considerations to make me choose one versus the other? Yeah, okay, so when, when, which one do you think is more likely to develop toxicity? The bigger dose, right? So imagine here if I had a line here, this is my line of toxicity. Well, that would mean that the bigger dose less frequently is more likely to cause that toxicity there than if I were to give it smaller dose less frequently. Even though the same average steady state concentrations, right? But you see those vacillations can make, make the difference there. Let's say, for instance, I was giving, uh, say, penicillin, right? What do you use penicillin for? As an antibiotic, right? Well, one thing you'll realize is that when you're giving penicillins, and certain uh, drugs fit within a class of, of medications, you have to give it every six hours. The reason why you have to do that is because there's a, there's a feature, and we'll talk about it extensively when we get into Farm 1, but there's something called a minimum inhibitory concentration. You guys ever heard of that from that microbiome? It means if a drug level gets below that, the bacteria start to reproduce again, right? So it's basically this kind of suppressive force from the antibiotic. But let's say, for instance, that I'm dosing an antibiotic, and the MIC is right here. Well, if I were to give that larger dose less frequently, you see them dipping below that MIC, guess what's going to happen during those periods? Bacteria start to grow, so that's not really the point I want. I want to kill those bacteria. So in those cases, I might have to give a drug more frequently, even though I know it's a compliance problem, but it's going to make sure that the drug is more efficacious, right? Some drugs that doesn't matter, some drugs that matters greatly. We'll learn about all those different ones uh, when we get to the, the next semester's material, right? Everyone with me so far? I assume. Yes, sir. Yeah, amoxicillin. Yeah, so that one, um, you know, is it'd be nice if I give it one time daily. Most of the time, it's either going to be Q12 hours, Q8 hours, because of that feature there it has to be above that MIC to kill off those bacteria. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, and again, just to to kind of reiterate the point here. Again, you could do a continuous infusion, but practically, practically, it's not going to be done in a lot of cases. There, um, the nice benefit of having a continuous infusion is that it is just that one steady concentration. I really don't have to worry about those vacillations, and it's very good for kind of titrating my dose very precisely. We do that a lot for uh, medications to help to raise blood pressure, to make sure I don't get, I get right to the blood pressure that I want to get to. But um, and again, if you're looking at this graph here, you can see you know what a fixed single dose would look like versus when I'm giving the continuous uh, the, the intermittent doses and how they kind of stack up on one another. And again, eventually that steady state is going to be achieved, assuming you keep the dose and the concentration or the, uh, the interval the same there. Okay. Now, this is actually really important. What would happen, do you think, if I were like, you know, say monitoring a drug via blood levels and say, for instance, I get a trough level, that's what I'm monitoring, and I check it, say, with the second dose here? Do you think it's going to be falsely low or falsely elevated? So say, for instance, you know, I'm trying to reach a certain concentration. So for instance, with this one, I want my trough to be above this, this line here, this 1.5. And I were to check it after that second dose there, what do you think I would think? It looks too low, right? So you'd say, okay, well, it looks like that, that level's too low. What should I do to the dose of the drug? You think you would elevate it, right? So what would that be, right? 
me wrong because I had not given that drug time to reach steady state. So that's a really important feature there. When you're monitoring levels, make sure you give the drug time to reach steady state, okay? If you don't, then you may actually adjust it too early and then you can eventually, when you get to that new dose of steady state, guess what? It's too high and now you got toxicity you're worried about, right? So just a little point how we uh, practically actually use these concepts uh, in, in the real world. Yes, ma'am. So that'd be equivalent to like when they tell you to take another dose then? So like if you're supposed to take it like once a day, every 12 hours, so that like the steady state would be the end of that 12 hours then? Um, no, that would be the trough level, right? So that end of that 12 hour period would be the lowest concentration that you would get, okay. right? Soon after the dose is at peak, that reaches the highest concentration, that in between part, that average between the two would be your steady state concentration, oh, okay. right? But that's what we're saying. Steady state is just the average concentration that you're reaching. So it would be the difference between the peak and the trough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what if I wanted to get around? So let's say I'm, I'm dosing a patient with amiodarone, but it's like I don't have a whole year to treat this ventricular tachycardia. The patient's going to be dead in five minutes if I don't do, do something. Is there a way to get around that? Do you want to give a big dose first and then titrate it down? Uh, you the opposite. You're actually, you're actually right. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So we have what we call... <laughs> You're a farm genius you didn't even know, right? Um, no, so we can give what we call a loading dose, right? This is where we give a really big bolus dose up front, the goal being to get us right at that steady state that we're looking for, and then you follow it up with a continuous infusion, or you follow it with uh, maintenance dosing, as we call it. Maintenance doses to maintain that same steady state concentration there. So if you look at this graph here, here's an example of get the pointer. Here's an example, the red line is going to be the loading dose that we give, and then the blue line is going to be the continuous infusion I give after, right? So this is an example of a drug called lidocaine. Lidocaine, you normally think about being as like a local anesthetic, like dental stuff. It's also an antiarrhythmic we can use potentially, but amiodarone would be fitting the same bill here. Essentially, what you do is give a really big bolus dose up front. This means that you immediately achieve the desired steady state concentration. Now, notice here what happens to this loading dose concentration over time. It gets eliminated, right? You're metabolizing and eliminating the drug just like normal. But I'm following it up by that continuous infusion. So as the loading dose is being eliminated, this continuous infusion I give afterwards is building up. And what do you notice about the concentration? It stays exactly the same, right? So again, as one's going down, the other one's building up, and my steady state concentration should not change. Now, again, the benefit of this is, is that if I have a drug with a long steady state or a long half-life, I can get to it immediately, right? or if it's something where I need to get concentrations right at the therapeutic level very quickly, because otherwise this patient might die, this is another case where I'd actually end up doing that. Or if anyone's ever uh, seen like a Z-Pack before, right? Z-Pack is, uh, anyone know what drug that is? Azithromycin, right? Uh, Zithromax is another name for that. Most people are familiar with Z-Packs. If, if anyone's ever seen one, how many pills do you take the first day? Take two, and then what, how many do you take after that? You take one. So you take two on the first day, and then you take one for the next four days. Why do you think you take two the first day? It's a loading dose. It gets you up to the uh, the concentration that's going to kill off the bacteria. Presumably it's a bacteria, hopefully not a virus. You guys won't ever do that, right? Don't give Z-Packs out for everything. A lot of times viruses. But you're going to get that big dose up front. It's going to get them to that average concentration where they're going to start to kill off the bacteria, and then the subsequent doses will keep you at that level. Okay, That's called maintenance dosing to keep you at whatever level you want to keep it at. Okay. Now it's not the same. Everyone ever seen like a steroid pack or like a uh, Medrol dose pack where it has like six tablets you take the first day and then five and four and three and two and one. That's a different thing. That's a taper, tapering kind of dose um, versus this would be a situation where I'm getting a loading dose to get you up to that active concentration very quickly. Okay. Make sense? All right. So anyway, so I mentioned the maintenance dosing is going to be uh, calculated basically by remembering that the average steady state concentration is equal to the dose I'm giving divided by that clearance times the dosing interval, right? So if I need to drive my steady state concentration up, I can either increase the dose, or what else could I do? I could decrease that interval, right? So give the drug more frequently. So go from, say, every 12 hours to every 8 hours, and that's, again, going to drive that steady state concentration up, okay? If I check the level, my steady state was too high, I could either decrease the dose or extend the interval I'm going to be dosing it at. Okay, so as an example, we have a lot of premature neonates that come over to Nemours. We have a lot of those kids transferring into us, and when kids are born premature, a lot of their organs are also premature, and that means their kidney function isn't really great. So for some of these antibiotics, we have to give them, say, for a, a full, mature, sort of, you know, 40-week gestational age infant, we would give them, say, every 24 hours. For someone who's born, say, 24 weeks gestation, we may have to give every 48 hours. Because we know their kidney function is not that great, because their clearance is lower, 
So to counteract the low clearance, I give a bigger interval. Does that make sense? That way, both babies, whether they're mature or not, should be having that same average steady state concentration. Okay. So a lot of a lot of things you see when you look up drug dosing um, is going to be already factoring in a lot of these features here. Okay. But again, another way we can rearrange this to figure out what kind of maintenance dose we would need to give is just to kind of put, okay, well, the dose is going to be equal to, basically just solving for that, the steady state concentration you're looking for times their clearance times that dosing interval. But again, know how the interval, uh, the different um, variables here are going to be affecting your concentration, going to be affecting your dose, et cetera. Here's an example of a drug that would be given uh, as a loading dose and then followed up with more maintenance dosing. Uh, There's a drug called clopidogrel or Plavix. Uh, it is used as an antiplatelet drug. So if you ever like work in a cath lab or see someone has a history of like heart stents or things like that, this is basically a drug that they'll receive. And they'll get a loading dose with a few oral doses, and then they get, actually get a lower maintenance dosing, but it keeps them at the average steady state concentration there. It keeps them at an antiplatelet sort of state where they're not going to clot up any of those stents you just put in. Okay, so again, um, looking at this, like, what do you think are some reasons why a patient would have a high concentration, a supra therapeutic concentration? What do you think it would be, just based off those variables there? Hmm? Yeah, low clearance, right? So again, if I don't check a patient, say renal function or hepatic function over a long period of time, clearance can change, right? So maybe I did not take that into account, and that could be a reason why that level is too high. What's another reason? Yeah, so maybe the dose is too high. Why would a dose be too high? Yeah, maybe you gave them too much. Maybe you miscalculated a dose. Right? That's happened before. You mix up pounds and kilograms and actually give too much drug. That's ha certainly happened before. What else? What are some other reasons why the dose might be too high? Hmm? Not necessarily with receptors, right? Because we're not we're talking about the dynamics of it. We're talking about the, the kinetics here. So um, other reasons, yeah, so maybe the patient's taking the drug too often, right? So maybe the interval has changed. You didn't know it. Now, is it possible that a patient's going to misconstrue your instructions and take a drug inappropriately? Do you think it happens often? Yeah, it happens a lot, right? So again, you have to think about things like, did you tell the patient to take it once a day and now they're taking it twice a day? Because they said, well, a little bit must be good, so more of it must be better, right? People do that, right? Um, so lots of different reasons why the dose might be different, not only uh, in your control, but also in the patient's control. Um, the clearance can change. Remember, the dosing interval can also change. Now, imagine if you have an elderly patient who is you know, tight on money. A lot of them are on fixed incomes. Uh, and they are, you know, supposed to take a drug twice a day, but they say, oh, I can't really afford doing this twice a day. So I'm going to take this 60 tablet uh, prescription. I'm going to just say, take, take it once a day. Now this month long prescription now lasts me two months, right? It's called intelligent non-compliance when they're going against your directions, but they're doing it intelligently because they think, okay, well, I got I to figure out some way to make this stretch out, right? And I can explain why levels might be too low or too high, depending on what the situation is. Okay. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Okay. Anyway, so again, how can we combat these? Again, good education is really important here. Make sure you're checking on clearances. Make sure you're looking at the renal function, look at the hepatic function, and that will help you out, right? And again, when you tell a patient something like, hey, take two tablets twice a day, how do you make sure that they understood what you had taught them? Teach back, right? You call it the teach back method where you say, here, you tell me how you think you're supposed to take this. And by doing that, you can really understand, okay, well, did they actually get this or not? Like, it's just like the lady said, like, how to use your inhaler, and she's spraying on her neck. Like, you can uncover a lot of really wacky stuff and hopefully, uh, you know, kind of head off any problems before they actually develop. Okay, so let's look at some other variables here that could be uh, coming into play. So let's look at reasons why you may have variable absorption in a patient, right? So compliance could be one thing, as I mentioned, maybe taking it, you know, more often or less often than they should. Um, but also think about things like drug-drug interactions or drug-food interactions. We'll come across specific examples, um, but as I mentioned before, like older patients, you know, they like to drink uh, a lot of milk, right? Why do they like to drink milk? Because that's your calcium, right? So you're supposed to drink calcium, get lots of calcium in, helps your bones out, right? Well, there's a lot of drugs that can bind up to that calcium, okay? So what do you think it does to the absorption of drugs in the, in the gut? It's going to decrease, right? Because if it's the calcium, you can't get absorbed. It's just be eliminated through the feces. So you may think, wow, this drug's not working, when really it's never got absorbed in the first place, right? Um, but again, things like patient education can really help out with this. Don't drink with grapefruit juice. Separate it out from other medications. Do whatever you have to do to help make sure that the absorption is actually going to occur. Look at the clearances I mentioned. You have to make sure you're looking at things like kidney function, liver function, heart function as well. You know, for instance, patients with congestive heart failure, they have a lot of venous backup, and that slows everything down. That's why I get a lot of that edema that builds up. Well, that also slows down the amount of blood being delivered to the liver. What do you think it does to clearance? 
it decreases it, right? Because it takes more time to get that blood circulated through to actually get rid of that drug there. So these are all things you have to consider there. And make sure you're going to be checking, look up your stuff beforehand to make sure you know how to adjust drugs appropriately. Uh, if you take nothing else away from this class, please, and I know I say that, I'll probably say it like 10 more times throughout the <laughs> class. If you take away nothing else, among the other 10 things, I'll say that too. Uh, make sure you look stuff up. Like if you're never not sure or if you've done it a million times, look stuff up. Because again, you may find something new, you may find something's changed, just look it up, okay? No one's going to fault you for actually looking up a drug reference to find out if you're actually doing the right thing or not. Okay, um, now getting into toxicities a little bit, kind of shifting a little bit around, um, reasons why toxicities might actually develop in patients here, right? So a lot of this could be related to kind of two different features here, one of which being uh, maybe you have identical receptors, but they're located in different tissues, right? So for instance, um, opioids, causing constipation. This is one of the big sort of um, nuisance sort of side effects you can find in a lot of patients who are taking opioids chronically. Now, normally when I give opioids, what am I giving it for? Yeah. Giving it for pain, right? It works in the spinal column, works in the brain to help reduce pain. Now, it works on opioid receptors, and those aren't just located in those areas. They're located throughout the body as well and in the GI tract. So the toxicity is induced through the same mechanism. It's just it's located in a tissue that I don't actually want to treat there. Do you know any ways you can get around that? Actually, you can do that intrathecal drug administration. So if you ever really have a patient who's going to labor and you give them an epidural, that's actually where you're administering opioids directly into the spinal column. They don't get constipation from that usually. Sometimes, but not usually, right? Um, in some cases, you may actually find that you can have different types of receptors uh, interacting here. So for instance, erythromycin, anyone know what kind of drug that is? It's an antibiotic. Um, normally used to kill off bacteria. Well, we also found out that it interacts with these modulin receptors you have in your GI tract, which you'll probably learn about from Professor Kaplan here pretty soon. Um, but we have modulin receptors. When you stimulate those, what do you think happens? Probably causes motility, right? And so you end up seeing increased peristalsis. And so what do you think is a side effect of that? Diarrhea, right? So again, it's very common. You're going to find erythromycin causes diarrhea. And you're like, why does that happen? Well, it's through a completely different receptor interaction that is not really expected based on the mechanism of the drug itself. So sometimes you'll find these kind of oddball sort of things here. Now, I can actually use that for therapeutic benefits. So a lot of like little kids you'll see that have um, uh, motility issues, we actually put them on erythromycin to help stimulate that peristalsis and help them actually absorb their food effectively and all of that. So again, sometimes we can use these to our benefit. Again, um, other reasons why patients might have super therapeutic concentrations, why they might develop toxicity, some of this might be intentional, right? So when I say abuse, what does that mean? Usually using it to a purpose, usually using it to get high or, uh, for instance, you know, I had a, a friend who was uh, really interested in uh, MMA, really interested in fighting, and so he was going to actually go into like a small, you know, competition uh, and he had to get down to a certain weight, right? What do you think he did to get down to that weight? Well, he used a lot of diuretics, right? He didn't get them from me, I can tell you that much. But he got diuretics, and he actually was able to get down a lot of water weight, though. But however, he was extremely dehydrated at the end of it. He felt miserable, a lot of headaches, you know. Uh, that's, that was abuse, so he's using it for a specific purpose. It was non-medicinal. It doesn't have to just be to get high, right? It's usually the reason, but there, there could be other ones, right? Um, attempted harm, right? So patients are trying to take medications in order to end their lives or harm themselves. Very, very common, as you'll see. Very sad, but very common. Um, and then unintentional things. So children getting into medications. How often do you think this occurs? All the time. Way more incredibly common than you might think. Actually, here's a good example. I like to give you guys cases uh, that I get when I'm on call for the Poison Center. And I got one recently. It was very interesting. I actually had a, a five-week-old uh, who was brought to the ER. Uh, the parents had spilled some of their vaping liquids. What do you think is in some of those liquids? Nicotine. Okay. Now you guys have learned about nicotine before, or nicotinic receptors at the very least, right? It's covered neuromuscular function in physio. What stimulates skeletal muscle to, to contract? Nicotinic receptors, right? What normally activates nicotinic receptors? Acetylcholine. In this case, nicotine can as well. That's how we found out. That's why I call them nicotinic receptors. So what happens? What do you think happens if I overstimulate those receptors? They desensitize, or they desensitize to the point where you can actually cause flaccid paralysis potentially. So this little baby pacifier got into some of the liquids. Again, I don't know how this stuff happened, but it happens. And then uh, got the pacifier in their mouth. And what do you think the parents found? They found the kids just kind of getting listless and then felt limp, right? They had the normal muscle tone or whatever. And then we come back and then got limp again. So that's why I brought him to the ER. 
So again, understanding how these receptors work and how the actual physiology goes and how the drugs go hand in hand, you can understand why patients may manifest certain types of toxicity. Uh, I think you had a hand up first. Yeah. Did the parents know that the, the thinking was inside the... I'm not sure what the situation was. Like, I didn't get to talk to them. I was just talking to the doc. So they, they kind of put two and two together. They're just like, okay, well, I think it was around here, and I think I remember spilling it. But also, the problem with a lot of those products is they're not really regulated by anyone, so they can get very, very concentrated, and even a small amount of, of nicotine in there can be really problematic for those kids. Yeah. Did it get clear? Hmm? It does get clear. Yeah, yeah. So the kid, we had to give them time to metabolize it, and so you know, after several hours in the ER, the kids actually back to baseline, so they ended up doing all right. Yeah. Um, you could do a blood test, but we don't have one specifically for nicotine. So that's kind of the problem is we don't have a lot of like definitive testing we can do. Um, I can honestly, I can give an entire elective just on developing toxidromes and coming up with differentials for, for poisons. I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to actually overdose you guys on, on that kind of information. <laughs> My LD50 is quite low for that stuff uh, for you guys. <laughs> But, um, yeah, there's, there's ways we can develop a differential. Just like you'll develop a differential, someone comes in with belly pain, you work up a list of things that could be. I do the same thing for drugs, uh, drug exposures, right? Okay, well, I don't know what it is, but here's the things that might be based off of presenting signs and symptoms, et cetera. Yeah, so it can be really tough. But anyway, so again, um, kids get into stuff all the time, whether you mean to or not, uh, it just happens, right? Um, but again, also look at things like impaired clearance, right? So renal function going down over time, liver function going down over time. Age is going to be a big factor here, whether extremes of very young ages, very old ages, a lot of this is going to factor into it. Just remember, everything can be poisonous. It just matters if you get the right dose or not. Yes, ma'am. What about weight loss? Weight loss can play a role too, right? So again, that can change things like the volume distribution, right? And we mentioned volume distribution goes down. What happens to the clearance of that drug, potentially? Usually, it tends to increase in a lot of cases there, so that can actually lead to maybe lower concentrations, even the same dose. Uh, maybe just based on their weight, it may actually just be too much for them, so it, it's variable depending on, on the case there. But yeah, we certainly have to make sure we're readjusting based off of weights. Uh, if anyone's interested, like, you know, in going to working in the NICU or something, I mean, those babies are constantly changing weights from day to day, and so you have to refactor in, okay, well, you know, am I dosing them sufficiently now, or is it too much for them, or what the case might be. Okay. Um, and again, most substances don't have antidotes. A lot of times I, I say the, the best treatment is the tincture of time. You can just give them time for the drug to metabolize and get rid of it um, and, and can provide good supportive care, right? It's really the best thing you do for a lot of patients. But I'll talk about this later on in Farm 2, close to the end of your uh, winter semester. So any questions on that section? If not, uh, take a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then get into the next one. All right, let's continue on. I noticed a few questions up here. Uh, some of these are quite interesting. I'm save one for last. Okay, uh, are there any positive benefits to grapefruit juice? I don't know. I, I, mean, I, like, I like the taste, I guess, but I'm not really big up on any other beneficial effects. Not really my realm of expertise, I would say. So, um, let's see, how does reading vancomycin levels work with respect to terms of this lecture? Half-life clearance, extremely relevant, right? So, for instance, um, vancomycin is one of those drugs. It's an antibiotic. Anyone know what kind of bugs we use it for, by any chance? Bacteria. Very icky. Very icky stuff. MRSA is a big one. You heard of like MRSA. It's the deadly MRSA. Yeah, it's really bad. Right? So we use vancomycin to treat that. Even if we don't know if patients have it or not, we use vancomycin as kind of an empiric coverage, and we'll talk more about that next semester. But um, as a narrow therapeutic index, if I have too high levels, you end up finding that it can cause things like ototoxicity, it can cause nephrotoxicity. The levels are too low. What do you think happens? The MRSA keeps growing, and it kills your patient, right? So by getting the levels in the right range, you can make sure that you're – getting efficacy without getting too much toxicity. And so every patient might be a little different, right? Depending on renal function, depending on their body habitus, depending on all these different things, the volume of distribution changes, their clearance changes. And so that's why I can start a patient off on, say, a standard dose. I say, okay, you're a relatively healthy adult, start you off on this dose. And then I check those levels. And based off that's too high or too low, then I adjust the dose, right? If the level's too high, that probably shows me that the clearance is low, right, because they're not getting rid of the drug, so I'm going to have to adjust the dose down, right? If the level looks too low, then I know maybe their clearance is pretty good, then I can bump them up, okay? So it's very relevant to that, and we'll have a whole section on this a little bit later on about therapeutic drug monitoring, right? Does that make sense? Do you have a question? Yeah, don't they, like, use dosing with, like, vancomycin, too? Mm -hmm. So um, frequently, we don't know what kind of bacteria that you're infected with, and so we'll use a wide range, yeah. So I could talk about using, like, the shotgun approach, where basically you just try to cover everything, and then when you find out what it is, then you, you pair back therapy. That's called de-escalation of uh, therapy there. Yep. 
Uh, okay, so next question is, uh, what is it that allows first order elimination or clearance to happen in the body? I'm confused on how the body can always eliminate 15% of whatever drugs in the system instead of getting rid of a constant amount like zero order. So the question is, um, you typically have more enzymes available or more uh, capacity available to metabolize than you actually will uh, ever use up with a given drug, right? At least at normal therapeutic doses. Now, in some cases, you actually have uh, some drugs that will actually flip from first to zero order. That's kind of outside of our scope here, but uh, there's a name for it. It's called Michaelis Minton Kinetics, and um, there's a drug called uh, Phenytoin. Anyone ever heard of Phenytoin before? It's a seizure medication. So I'll give you a really good example of how this comes into play. So we had a patient who came in uh, complaining of seizures, right? So he came in at, uh, after a seizure. We checked a Phenytoin level on the patient, and it was presumably low, right? So we checked it, and it came back low. So we went ahead and we gave her a bolus dose of phenytoin, right? The bolus, like a loading dose, was to do what? Get her back up to a therapeutic concentration, right? So that was the goal. So anyway, so it happened right around shift change. Anyone know when shift change are in a hospital? Seven and seven, right? So this is a seven morning shift change. So the resident from overnight wrote the order. The nurse gave it, did not document that the dose had been given. The next shift nurse came on. She saw an order for phenytoin, didn't, wasn't documented. Guess what happened? She gave another dose. Okay, so she gave a second dose of phenytoin. Now we have saturated all of those enzymes. And let's say, for instance, she would have metabolized it to a point where she needed to be dosed every eight hours. We well saturated those enzymes, and now the half life was extended extremely, extremely long. So that way her levels were high and they were staying high for a really long time. And so phenytoin, basically a phenytoin overdose, we had it on our hands at that point. And so we ended up having to find ways to, to clear that out a little bit faster. But Again, once you saturate those enzymes, then it switches over to zero order kinetics, and then it takes a lot longer time to get rid of that drug. Okay, does that make sense? So you can basically have more capacity than what the drug's ever going to use up realistically, unless there's some very specific instances where this is not the case. Okay. Anyway, so the last question I thought was quite entertaining. Uh, what happens if a baby gets a pacifier covered in THC instead of nicotine? Do they need to go to the hospital or will they just be chilling? <laughs> So a lot of it depends on the dose that they actually received, right? Um, they will probably be chilling. Um, <laughs> however, it could be other stuff too, right? So if you see a toddler acting altered, when I say like altered, I mean like altered mental status, like not their normal, um, they probably need to be checked out because it could be a number of things. So if you didn't know this THC exposure, maybe it was alcohol intoxication, maybe it's hypoglycemia, maybe it has meningitis, could be a whole host of different things. So yeah, I would probably send that patient in, uh, especially if it was a five-week-old and they're acting wonky. I would say, mm, let's, let's get you checked out, right? And then how could I check to see if it was THC or not? You could use a urine drug screen. Yeah, I could actually test the urine there uh, and, and get that. There's actually a really interesting case where sometimes uh, for urine drug screens, other substances will cross-react. So you have what we call a false positive. And so there actually was a, um, a maternity ward. The ladies were given birth. And so sometimes if they were suspecting abuse of substances by the moms, they'll actually check the urine of the babies to see if they're being exposed to anything. And so they have all these babies that are showing a positive for THC. And then the moms are like, I've never touched this stuff in my life. Like, what the heck's going on? They're talking about getting, you know, Department of Children and Families involved and taking their babies away and all this kind of stuff. They're like, well, what's going on? They actually found was there's a moisturizer that they were using on the babies that was being absorbed because babies didn't have pretty thin skin. Uh, they actually cross-reacted with the assay. So they checked the mom. Guess what? She was negative, but the babies were positive. They linked it back to that moisturizer that they were being exposed to. Again, medicine's pretty cool, pretty weird sometimes. Anyway, uh, any questions on that? Don't give your babies THC. <laughs> Or dogs or any, or any animals, just don't do it. Babies are kind of like little animals, so. Okay, any other questions before I continue on? Thank you for getting me off topic. You find it's very easy to put me on digressions, and I'll eat up all the class time just talking about stuff that I find interesting. Anyway, um, so talking about toxicities, right, getting into adverse reactions. What is an adverse reaction? Something bad, right? Something bad happening as a result of a drug. Usually an unpleasant or harmful potential reaction there. Um, and typically it's related to the use of medicinal products. When you hear about adverse reactions, we're talking about drugs most frequently. Um, and basically, we know that when someone has an adverse reaction, we can do several things, right? If it's bad enough, we say, well, let's not give that drug ever again. Maybe we need to alter the dose. Maybe there's something else we need to give along with it. So uh, as an example, if someone has a lot of caffeine ingestion and they get heartburn from it, we can give something to actually counteract that, right? You can use another medication to prevent that from occurring if that hypothetical situation ever actually occurred there, right? Point being is that by knowing an adverse reaction, if it happens, we can do something about it potentially, right? 
Now, there's six categories of adverse reactions, and we'll kind of go through each one of these. Um, we'll find that some of these can be predicted, some cannot, and some of them we can do things about. Sometimes we can't, as the case may be. I kind of use this A, B, C, D, E, F mnemonic here, uh, whether it be a dose-related issue, like an augmented dose being the issue here, bizarre reaction, non-dose related, and we have some that are related to time, so how long someone's been on a medication, and then withdrawal and finally failure of therapy. So I'll we'll talk about those uh, more specifically now. So looking at dose, so uh, uh, as an augmented reaction, meaning that this is a pretty common thing. So you give a medication, say for instance, you have an allergy, uh, allergic reactions to something like say pollen in the air, and what kind of medication might you take for that? I take Benadryl, right? And then what kind of side effects might you get from Benadryl? You get drowsy, right? Did you take it to get drowsy in the first place? No, but you know, it's just related to that dose of a drug. Maybe 25 milligrams is totally fine for you. Take 50, you're out for the count, right? It just depends on how the person's going to react to that. And again, it has to do with things that are common. We know that it's dose related. It's related to the mechanism of the drug. And typically, we can predict these sorts of things here, right? These include most of your general side effects you're going to find with medications. Or as an example, if I were to give you an antihypertensive, what do you think is a pretty common adverse reaction you could see from that? Low blood pressure, right? If I were to give you insulin for hyperglycemia, what do you think is the adverse reaction you might see from that? Hypoglycemia, right? A lot of this is predictable because it's based off the mechanism and how the drug's working itself, okay? Now, the non-dose related, the bizarre sort of reactions are uncommon. Now, these are not going to be, um, uh, you know, really related to the mechanism of action of the drug. A lot of times they're very unpredictable, and because of that, there's a higher mortality associated with it. We're not really sure who's going to have a bad reaction. So as an example, if you had someone who had took a penicillin for the first time and they had anaphylaxis, now can you just look at a person and, and determine if they're going to have anaphylaxis? No, you can't really get a good history. Uh, you know, does your grandpa have anaphylaxis? Doesn't mean you're going to have it. So it's hard to tell, which means there's more uh, morbidity and mortality associated with that. But also things like um, there's something called malignant hyperthermia. Anyone ever heard of that? If you're working on a surgery or in the ER, you've probably at least seen uh, there's a cart that you usually have in both of those places. Uh, uh, for it. Uh, basically, it's a, a mutation that some people will have in their ryanodyne receptors. Have ever heard of that in terms of neuromuscular physiology? It's responsible for releasing all the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Some people have a reaction to where when they receive uh, either a general anesthetic, like a gas, or they receive a drug called succinylcholine, they basically release all that calcium, all their muscles get really tensed up, they get really acidotic and hyperthermic, and they die. That's something we can't predict. In patients, but sometimes by asking the question, like, hey, do you have any, you know, family members who've had a bad history of, of anesthesia or anything like that? Sometimes I'll uncover some of those things there, but most of the time you can't predict it. Getting to the, the more chronic reactions, these are dose and time related. Um, they're relatively uncommon, but they're typically going to be seen with more kind of cumulative uh, dose and time associated with the medications here. So as an example, um, your adrenal glands normally produce what? Cortisol is one of the main components, right? It also makes some epinephrine, but cortisol is the main thing we're talking about. So cortisol, so what happens if I were to say give you exogenous or outside of the body, give you corticosteroids to replace that cortisol? The adrenal glands actually will stop working. They'll say, okay, well, we have enough steroids around here, right? It's that negative feedback loop. You guys familiar with those? It's going to say, hey, I got enough steroids. We don't need to do anything. So they kind of shut down and they tend to atrophy. Well, what happens if I withdraw that drug? Well, you're going to find that you're not going to be producing a lot of cortisol, and you can get into some problems with that. So, again, we understand that this happens with long enough use. Now, if you have an asthma attack, and they give you five days of prednisone, probably not going to be a big deal. But if I give it to you consistently, say, for weeks or months or years, then at that point, yes, that absolutely is the case there. So it has more to do with the time length and the dose that they're receiving to get around that. So what are some ways I could get around that, you think? Hmm? Yeah, I can, so I can change the route that's used, right? I can maybe, if I'm only aware of the lungs, I can just give it to the lungs. Sometimes using smaller doses or for shorter periods of time, there's some ways you can get around those sorts of things, right? Now, some things are just basically time-related, so it has nothing to really do with the dose necessarily, um, but it's going to be just on for patients who have been on a drug for a long period of time. And, and again, uh, it's not usually apparent until they've been on it for a while. Uh, so as an example here, a lot of antipsychotics, used for schizophrenia, they develop what we call tardive dyskinesia. It's kind of this irreversible side effects. Um, they have a lot of um, uh, you know, abnormal tics and things like that that will happen. Um, so if you ever see like an older patient with schizophrenia who's been on medication for a long time, they may have like a lot of lip smacking or tongue smacking and things like that. That's related to that tardive dyskinesia. They've just been on the drug for too long. <coughs> Excuse me. Other things like teratogenesis. Anyone know what that is? 
Yeah, essentially. So it's, it's birth defects and uh, um, alterations that happen to the fetus based on maternal drug exposure. Uh, so as an example here, there's a, a drug called uh, valproic acid. We use it for seizures, but we also use it for bipolar disorder. And again, when a woman gets pregnant, does she know the second it happens? Does a bright light shine down on her and little angels come out and say, you're pregnant? <laughs> that would be lovely, but it doesn't happen that way, right? And again, when do organs develop in the fetus? Like, it's that first trimester. It's that organogenesis feature there. And that's the most critical time where drug exposure could affect organ development there. So a lot of times women are taking these drugs and may not know that they're pregnant. You can have this exposure there, right? And so you can actually see neural tube def uh, defects that can occur when they're on this valproic acid and have that drug exposure, right? So again, sometimes these things we just don't know until they actually have the baby. And you see it. Normally you find that stuff on ultrasound. But it's just one of those things that um, it's not readily apparent at the, the very beginning, right? Uh, other reactions, withdrawal. So again, this is just what it sounds like. Taking away the drug immediately leads to these adverse reactions here. Um, now, these are things like uh, antidepressants can do this, uh, opioids, you know, sleep medications, you know, all these things you typically see rebound effects, these withdrawal effects. And so there are ways we can get around that sometimes. Uh, so as an example, I can give drugs with longer half-lives, and that allows them to have a natural taper to the level and will uh, ameliorate some of those adverse reactions, right, those withdrawal reactions. So as an example, anyone, if I had a patient who was opioid uh, addicted and I was trying to get them off of that, anyone know like a popular drug that they could use to do so? You never heard of like methadone before? Go to, like, go into the methadone clinic? Methadone has a really long half-life, has a half of like 50 some odd hours. And so the point being is that if I'm having someone who's ad uh, addicted to heroin and I put them on methadone, I can give them one dose and it will last them basically a whole day by having that long taper and preventing those withdrawal phenomena, right? So sometimes we can get around that by actually changing the drug we're using or by using something that has a longer half-life. Um, other things would be like the beta blocker example I mentioned where you have that upregulation of all those beta receptors and I take away the beta blocker and all of a sudden you have this exaggerated rebound effect and you can induce an MI. That's a withdrawal phenomenon. Okay. And then failure therapy, again, pretty common. Uh, a lot of it could be related to uh, drug interactions. It could be related to not giving a big enough dose. Um, this is why it's really important that if you have a patient who drugs are not working for, you want to find out, like, one, are they being compliant? Uh, are they actually, you know, maybe having a drug interaction you weren't aware of? Because uh, again, like if you as a provider, um, are you the only provider your patients are going to be seeing? Typically, no. They have a lot of specialists or things like that. Everyone's prescribing different medications. It's really good to do a full history to make sure there's interactions you're, you're catching there, right? Um, but an example, like if I had a patient who's on a fluoroquinolone, a type of antibiotic like uh, Levaquin or Cipro, if they're taking it along with calcium, it'll bind that up, and then it won't absorb, right? So, again, they're taking it like they're supposed to, but the bacterial infection is still around. could be related to a drug-food interaction, right? Or, as an example, oral contraceptives with enzyme inducers. We mentioned before we were talking about the CYP enzyme system. If I induce that, what does that mean? I'm upregulating, right? I have more enzymes available to metabolize those. So, normally, oral contraceptives are made up of estrogens, and anyone know what the other product is? progesterone, right? Well, what happens if I were to increase metabolism of those hormones? Levels would drop, right? Because I'm going to have more enzymes available, so more of it's being metabolized. And so what do you think it does to the risk of getting pregnant? It increases, right? Would you consider a pregnancy an adverse reaction? It's a lifelong one that uh, is quite expensive, as it turns out. So it's really, really important that if you have an issue like this, or they could be potentially having an enzyme inducer on board that they know about that, right? They either go on an alternative form of contraception or they do something, or switch drugs, whatever the case may be, to get around that, right? Because, again, that's not something you want to be like, oops, like, that's a pretty big oops to run into. I'll, I'll let you know. It's having a nice little miracle baby on, on my hands, I can tell you. It's not a big oops you're necessarily looking forward to. But, um, but we love them anyway, right? They're fantastic. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> no, I love both of them. They're they're great. They're both wonderful. Anyway, um, so kind of looking at you know the term side effect versus adverse reaction, there's a little bit of a difference to the two there. You might hear some people use them interchangeably. Typically, side effects are kind of the more nuisance sort of reactions or things that you know you can maybe uh, educate on on ways to avoid or get around. Um, but they normally are going to occur just on normal therapeutic use of the drugs. You just know they're going to happen, right? Versus adverse reactions tend to be a little bit more severe, those things we need to uh, maybe educate patients on, like here are the things to stop taking the drug for, right, if they happen. I'll give you some examples here. But in some cases, side effects are a good thing, right? So has anyone ever heard of the drug Latisse? Yes, what does Latisse do for you? They give you longer eyelashes, right? And actually, does anyone know what Latisse was originally used for? 
for glaucoma, right? So it was actually glaucoma medication that lowers intraocular pressure, but they were giving it to these uh, patients and they noticed like, wow, Joe's got some really long, luscious looking lashes. <laughs> and Joe's like, thanks, I've been working on it. But uh, it actually was, it was a prostaglandin that he was receiving there. And so they actually realized, well, what if we use this for an alternative purpose here? Why don't we use this adverse effect, the side effect, right? Not, not what the drug was used for, but it's an additional effect there for our purposes here. So we can use it for, for instance, now aesthetic purposes. Um, however, other things you can see with that drug, it may actually turn your iris brown. Right, so if you have pretty baby blue eyes, now all of a sudden they're brown, that could be an untoward adverse reaction. Some of you might not really like that, right? So other cases here. So adverse reaction versus side effects. So for instance, uh, anyone ever heard of Bactrim before? It's an antibiotic used a lot for UTIs and skin infections. Um, it is a combination drug, of uh, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. Um, basically, if you give this to a patient and they get, say, sun exposed, they can have some rash associated with that. It's called photosensitivity, okay? Kind of a side effect. It's not something that I would necessarily say stop taking the drug for, but I'd say, hey, maybe put on some sunblock or stay out of the sun as the case may be. However, they can have a much more severe adverse reaction called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, where basically all the skin starts to just slough off of the patient and it's potentially fatal. You have to educate on both of these, one on how to avoid, and the other one saying, if this happens, what do you need to do? go to the ER, right? You need to absolutely stop taking the drug and go to the ER immediately. So it's kind of the delineation between the two there. Other case here, um, as an example, Viagra or Sildenafil. Anyone remember where we talked about that before? For erectile dysfunction, because you also use things like pulmonary hypertension. Um, one of those things you can find is that, uh, say for instance, it's a side effect. Remember, how did Viagra work? Anyone remember? Going back to that lecture. Yeah, it causes smooth muscle relaxation, right? It causes vasodilation that allowed for erections to occur. It also does that to the esophagus, right? It actually can lower, lower esophageal sphincter tone and cause reflux to occur. So that's a known side effect. We know that, right? Um, however, what if you suddenly went blind all of a sudden? That could be a problem, right? That's an adverse reaction. That's something you say, okay, well, if this ever happens, if you have any blurry vision or if you ever have any vision loss, stop taking the drug and go to the ER, right? Those are uh, some differences there. Lesenopril is an example of an ACE inhibitor. Guess you remember the renal angiotensin system is how we can interact with this. It's a very popular antihypertensive, um, but a side effect. Because of the mechanism of the drug, it builds up a product called bradykinin, and it causes a cough. If you ever see people on lisinopril, they'll have potentially a really dry, hacky sort of cough. It's a reason why a lot of people don't like the drug. They'll switch over to something else. But another really severe adverse reaction that could occur is called angioedema, where basically their entire airway gets extremely swollen, and you have to make sure you intubate them. Otherwise, if you lose that airway, it could be a bit of a problem, right? So again, you have tongues like that that are just like so swollen, you can't even close their mouth around it uh, due to that angioedema that develops there. Okay. So how do we avoid adverse reactions? How do we avoid medication errors? Because are you likely to make a medication error at some point in your career? If you said no, you're lying to yourself. Absolutely, everyone is fallible. Everyone can make mistakes, and you're going to make a mistake at some point, right? Um, has anyone ever heard of the Swiss cheese model? Okay, so this is an important concept to understand. If you ever work in a hospital, you'll probably hear about it again. Um, the Swiss cheese model is that every healthcare provider uh, is a piece of Swiss cheese, right? And what does Swiss cheese have in it? Holes, right? So that means those are places where errors can occur. Now, presumably, if you as a provider, if you order a medication, so you order the wrong dose on accident, um, that order would then go to the pharmacist, and presumably I would catch that, right? Do I always catch that? I would like to think I would, but maybe I don't. Now, all of a sudden, two holes of the Swiss cheese have lined up. So then all of a sudden I process that order, goes through, and then it gets to the nurse. Do you think she's going to catch it? Hopefully, right? She'll see, oh, this is kind of a weird dose of the size patient. Or this is an odd one. Uh, but what if she doesn't? Guess what? Now all the holes have lined up, and now that medication error has now made it to the patient. Even though there's a lot of stop, or there's a lot of checks along the way, errors still happen. And again, they're pretty, pretty frequent uh, as it turns out. It doesn't matter where you work, errors are always going to happen there. So that's the Swiss cheese model. Point being, we can do things to try to limit the holes on the Swiss cheese and hopefully prevent them from lining up, okay? So we talked about the five rights of drug administration. So, uh, and again, some of these things might be like, well, give it, give the drug to the right patient. Does that sound pretty hard? We'll find out. It can be a little more difficult than you think, right? So when we talk about the five rights, it's the right drug, the right patient, the right dose, route, and time. So see some ways that this might be actually be difficult, right? So for instance, the right drug can be harder than you think. So for instance, a lot of drugs have different formulations. So an XR, 
SR, CR, ES, like there's a lot of different uh, varieties of drugs. There may be different salts or different formulations. And if you get one of those wrong, if you order the wrong one, that can lead to some issues there. So as an example, if you have someone who comes into the ER, who do you think most frequently does the medication reconciliation? It's the nurse, right? The nurse will be usually that point of contact with the patient. They say, what are you taking? And they'll fill it out on the computer, right? Now, they'll usually just pick the first thing they see in the list and maybe not give it a second thought. And they pick the wrong formulation. Then when they get admitted, you're going through that list saying, well, what do I want to keep? What do I want to get rid of? And if you select the wrong one, then that patient gets that medication incorrectly, and that's an error, right? So those are things to consider. Also, a lot of over-the-counter products, you know, NyQuil, Tylenol, they can refer to a lot of different products there with a lot of different drugs in them because it's brand name, right? They just put it on everything. So you have a patient who says, I take Tylenol, but maybe it's Tylenol PM, and now that has an antihistamine in it, right? That means it's a totally different drug. Um, other things as well, being in Florida, being in the land of the mouse, we get a lot of foreign people coming in to go on vacation, right? So I can't tell you how many times I've had to uh, figure out what a Portuguese translation of Tylenol is or albuterol or things like that um, based off of patients coming in with their own medications and we have to figure out what they take, right? And again, oftentimes uh, translator services might be delayed in getting, the, you know, getting to the patient, whatever the case may be. Um, so as an example, like if you had someone coming from the UK and they were on their asthmatic, they might carry salbutamol with them. And you would need to know that that's in English. American English, I should say, uh, is albuterol, right? Or, for instance, paracetamol is the UK version of Tylenol, acetaminophen. And again, how do you think I, if I, if I get something, say, from South America or somewhere, uh, a country I'm not familiar with, a language I'm not familiar with, um, how do you think I go about finding the translation? I Google it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how much education you get, everyone still Google stuff, and we still do it day to day. Um, but yeah, so I'll just Google in, I'll put in what it is, and then hopefully get a translation back, and we'll say, oh yeah, this is actually a beta blocker, or this is you know ibuprofen, whatever the case may be. Um, but again, you have to double check on this stuff and make sure you're you're figuring out what the right, right translation is. Now, the right patient, um, very frequently, especially if you're working like in a busy ER or busy setting, um, it's very possible you could have three or four patients with the same last name all lined up together, right? You could have four Smiths and two Rodriguez's and five, uh, you know, Chans or whatever the case may be, there, a lot of people have the same last name. And so if you screw up and you get the wrong patient, the wrong drug, guess what? Uh, that's an issue there. Um, siblings are a big problem, especially at the children's hospital. Um, I'll tell you, they have, uh, when, when NICU kids get uh, transported to us and they're twins, oftentimes they don't have an actual first name yet. So there'll be baby A and baby B. So baby A Jones and baby B Jones, okay? And so then we want to put them in the same room because, you know, it's just like be close together and the family can have them all in the same room. And so there'll be a bed A and a bed B. So intelligently you would think put baby A into bed A and baby B into bed B. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that flipped. And so that way baby B is in bed A and baby A is in bed B. Makes no sense, right? The problem is, though, <laughs> is it's very easy to screw things up and give the wrong drug to the wrong patient. So what are some ways we can get around that, do you think? You see, we have a lot of barcode scanning, so every patient's going to have a unique barcode associated with them, so that way they can get it scanned. Uh, and, and actually, the one, the guys who like get this, the barcodes on the back of their neck, we'll use those sometimes. Just kidding, don't do that. But, um, <laughs> but it looks really cool, right? Uh, um, so anyway, so they'll have a unique barcode. We'll scan that, and they'll say, "Hey, this is this patient, right?" Or it'll give you an error, say, "Hey, wait, wait a second, this drug is in order for this patient." Now I'll tell you, does that always work? How, what are some ways that might fail? Well, I'll have the nurse call me up and she says, hey, I, um, I gave this medication to the patient and then I scanned it and I said it was wrong. Okay. Um, you got to scan first, right? You have to go through the safety processes and then they'll tell you those errors before you give the medication. But oftentimes they'll try to do workarounds and that's where a lot of errors come up there. So that's, that's kind of some issues you run into. Um, but also remember, you know, sometimes if you just say, hey, go give this to the patient in bed three. The patient in bed three might change like two times already in the past hour. So depending on where you're working at, you need to make sure you're being very clear about using first, last names, MRNs, using you know, medical record numbers, you know, using identifiers to make sure you got the right patient, okay? So again, wrong patient happens uh, quite, quite frequently. Uh, the right dose. Make sure you're checking things like their organ function, making sure you're checking age and gender, et cetera, to see if any of those have a factor on how you should be dosing that medication there. Um, I'll give you an example of how the medication reconciliation process can go, uh, go incorrect. Sometimes, so we had uh, there's one hospital uh, that had uh, basically they had a system where a pharmacy technician would go and ask the patient what medications you take. They would go back, tell the ER pharmacist, they would put it in the computer, and then whenever the patient got admitted, the docs would just go through and, and reorder it. Okay, well they had a patient who was taking methadone, 
And technician said, uh, okay, what dose of methadone do you take? And they said, I don't know, like, you know, 80 milligrams three times a day or something. It's a really big dose, but it was something that could be reasonable depending on the patient. Okay. So anyway, so I went back to the pharmacist and then said, okay, here's the dose. The pharmacist said, okay, sounds good. Ordered it. And then the doc who was admitting just said, okay, sounds good. Let's order that. So uh, they did not take into account the patient might lie. And so it was actually way bigger dose than what they actually were on. And no one ever called to check. So then when, how do you think the patient was when they found the next day? near comatose, right? He was very, very sedate and actually had to give him Narcan to reverse it out of him, right? So you might think, do patients always tell you the truth? Okay, I'm glad none of you are naive enough to think they might, but yeah, they, they lie to you quite frequently as it turns out. Uh, in toxicology, we always say, how do you tell if a patient's lying? Their lips are moving, right? So. <laughs> how long ago was that? How long ago was that? Yeah. Uh, probably a couple of years or so. Okay, because I feel like it's at least a little bit different now in Florida. Like there was a lot more like stops that are. Yes. Yeah, so nowadays we have a little bit more. We have things like the prescription drug monitoring program. We can actually check online. I can go into a patient's profile and figure out what, what they fill, when they last filled it, et cetera. Um, yes, yeah, so this was before a lot of those checks were in place, unfortunately. It can still happen though, right? Harrison can still happen no matter what. Um, Anyway, the right route, right? So make sure you're giving drugs via the correct route. So for instance, um, accidentally giving uh, medication via the wrong route can be fatal in some cases. So I'll tell you an example. We have a lot of kids we treat for leukemia, and very frequently they're getting uh, drugs IV, and they're also getting a drug intrathecally at the same time. We're very close together. Um, one drug called vincristine, which is a chemotherapeutic drug, if you give it intrathecally, it's fatal. And so how do you think we know that? Someone accidentally gave it and or gave it that way, and they found it was fatal. So because of that, we had to put a lot of stop gaps into place to make sure we don't do that. So for instance, um, we always put vincristine into a bag. We don't put it into a syringe because someone could accidentally hook that up to someone's back and give it to them intrathecally, right? So a lot of things we have to make sure we're giving the correct route. Um, sometimes you give medications via non-traditional routes. So for instance, it can actually give you a laxative called docusate into the ear, and it actually will break up ceramin there. If you have impacted ceramin, it'll help to break that up, and then you can clear out the ear, right? unconventional, but it works. Um, sometimes we'll give oral products intravenously, very rarely. It's one called N-acetylcysteine, we use for Tylenol poisoning. Um, it just depends on the case there. But the reason why it matters is because if given via the wrong route, you can cause uh, potential issues here. So for instance, if I were to give that drug I mentioned, phenytoin intramuscularly, it actually causes severe tissue necrosis, right? You don't want to do that. Uh, vitamin K or phytonidione uh, given intramuscularly can cause uh, hematomas. So again, routes can be really important to make sure you get those correct. Uh, the right time. Uh, again, timing of medications, depending on the medication, can be very critical. Uh, as an example, if I give acetaminophen too often, the big organ toxicity with that is the liver. Right? The liver's going to take it. No, my battery's going out or what? But I'll keep going. Um, if I take pain medications too frequently together, perhaps I'll see increased sedation, right? Um, or as an example, emergency contraception failures. Um, so say, for instance, you have a patient who needs to go get plan B, right? Um, can you tell them, hey, you know, go get it next week sometime? Next couple of weeks, next month. <laughs> that timing is very critical. So you say, okay, well, then 48 to 72 hours, and you have this done, right? Things like that. So timing can be very important. Uh, antibiotics given too infrequently may lead to infection or resistance, you know, so giving it every 24 versus every eight, you may see resistance happen, right? Okay, so uh, kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, we find that uh, a couple of terms here. We mentioned bioavailability is just what? And what percentage of that drug you're actually getting into the circulation, right? You mentioned bioavailability of IV routes is 100%, right? But oral could be anywhere between 0 to 100, depending on the drug there. Um, now, one of the things you're going to find is that we talked about drugs uh, coming onto the market, right? We talked about they're having a patent. Anyone remember the length of that patent? 20 years, right? That's 20 years they have to, to get the drug through the clinical trials and make their money back. Afterwards, that expires, and then what comes out? Generics, right? Well, how do they actually come up with generics? How do they actually show that these are okay to give as a substitute for the brand name? Well, they have to show what we call bioequivalence. Basically, they have to show uh, that they are identical in the strength and concentration of the drug, they have to have the same dosage form, the same route, and they have to show that based off of giving the original drug to the patient and giving the generic, they have the same exact blood levels, right? That's to show they have to get the same peaks, same troughs, everything is the same between the two. Once I can show that to the FDA, they say, okay, you're good to go, and now you can uh, be a generic. Now, again, how can we alter the bioavailability of drugs, as we'll see here? Um, again, changing the route is a big one we already mentioned, right? Between IV to PO, that can change bioavailability pretty great. Um, but other things as well. 
as an example, um, looking at things like acid base of the drug, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, absorption, whether it's bound to proteins or not, we're going to get into all these factors here in just a moment. So, and going back to this slide uh, before, remember, it's a good one to review because it kind of gives you some comparisons between the various routes here. Um, always IV is going to have the max, then things like, you know, sub-Q, IMs a little bit less potentially, and then, you know, oral is always going to be the biggest kind of grab bag. Could be zero, could be 100, just depends on, on the drug itself. So, um, again, getting back to our acid-base review and talking about bioavailability, you guys remember the Henderson-Hasselbeck we talked about before, right? Has everyone already repressed that memory? <laughs> okay, I'll bring it back for you. Um, now remember, normal pH is within the body. So the normal serum pH, anyone know what that is? Yeah, 7.35, 7.45. How about the pH of the stomach? Uh, 2. How about the pH of urine? It's a little variable. 5.5 to 8, depending on if you're trying to get rid of bicarb or not, right? Um, how about the small intestine? Close to like seven or eight, you know, because again, you're getting a lot of bicarb coming up from the pancreas. So, again, pH changes depending on where you're at, depending on what kind of solution you're dealing with. And remember, that affects the ionization of those drugs, right? So, again, uh, do drugs get absorbed better when they're more polar or more un not polar? Less polar, right? Because, again, remember, they're polarized, they're charged. Remember, they're going to bounce off those membranes. Again, I can't just get rid of everything after I talk about it in lecture, right? You can remember some of this stuff, right? Um, but remember, this goes back to those PKAs. Remember that like dissolves like is the biggest takeaway from that. Remember that if I put a weak acid into an acidic solution, what happens to its absorption? Goes up, right? If I put a weak base into a basic solution, it's going to go up, right? So like dissolves like. Things get absorbed better when they're in their kind of home environment, so to speak. So as I mentioned, those water molecules are polar, right? They need to, uh, they're going to be able to attract those positive and negative charges on those molecules there. Again, the more charge it is, the more water soluble. Drugs need to be somewhat polar, right? If they're completely immiscible in water, they wouldn't go into solution, and they may not be absorbed very well at all. But they have to strike that right balance between being somewhat polar and also having that lipophilicity to allow them to cross over those biologic membranes, right? That's why if you ever have a drug that comes like in an oil, you can't inject that into the bloodstream. What do you think happens? Does oil and water mix? No, it doesn't. That can actually cause uh, an emboli. You don't want that to occur. Um, we have to sometimes get those drugs intramuscularly where it can then slowly absorb and it's not as big of an issue. So little things like that to consider. Just remember, the more charged it is, the less lipid soluble it's going to be, the harder time it's going to have uh, be absorbed, and that decreases that bioavailability. Again, just kind of showing what the polar looks like, you know, when they're having the negative ends of the oxygen kind of being attracted to the positive sodium and vice versa. And just remember... Polar bears don't like to go in the water because they'll dissolve. Anyway, but remember the acid situation we talked about. Having aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, what type of pH do you think it would rather be absorbed in? Two or eight? Probably two, right? Because again, it's a weak acid put into an acidic solution that's going to increase that bioavailability because more of it's going to be in the state here where it picks up that proton. And it's going to be able to be more lipo uh, lipophilic and get absorbed a little bit easier in those cases. Now, as an example of the drug called pyrimethamine, uh, which is used uh, potentially for uh, certain infections, um, it's a weak base, right? So getting it into the small intestine where the pH is a little bit higher is going to put it more to the state where it's going to be dropping off that proton and it's going to be in the non-charged state. If it was in the stomach, you're going to find it's going to be that NH3+, plus, not absorbed very easily at that point. So again, just remember, if it picks up a proton, it's charged, it's going to have a harder time being absorbed, and vice versa is true as well, okay? You can just kind of review for what we're talking about. And what happens when we get to the, the the pH and the pK of the drug are the same? Remember, it's 50-50 between the charge and the uncharged state, right? That's going to be that equilibrium point when the pK and the pH are identical. That's when you're seeing that. Uh, if I shift it one way or the other, you're going to see you're going to favor the formation of one or the other. But remember, it's always an equilibrium between the two uh, states there. Okay, and just remember as we're going to be, uh, that log, uh, the protonated versus unprotonated is that ratio that we're describing when we're looking at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Again, I'm not going to have you calculate anything from this, but knowing the concepts behind it are a really important thing here. Again, more weak acids tend to be lipid-soluble at acidic pH. More weak bases are going to be more lipid-soluble at alkaline pHs. Okay, that's going to aid that absorption a little bit better. Um, so if you can imagine if I were to, say, take uh, aspirin along with an antacid, say I were to give you something like calcium carbonate or Tums, what do you think that's going to do to the absorption of the drug? It'll decrease it, right? The antacid will neutralize the stomach acids. It'll cause the pH of the stomach to go up, and that means that aspirin is going to be more in that 
charged state where it's an A minus state, right? It's in the charged acid, uh, and it's kind of a harder time being absorbed there, right? Calcium is another good example of that. Calcium really likes to be absorbed in an acidic solution. So if I give people things like proton pump inhibitors or antacids chronically, you tend to find they have a harder time absorbing calcium, and that can worsen things like osteoporosis for patients who are older. Okay, so little considerations. We'll get into the specific situations later, but again, I want you to know the concepts here. Okay, so again, looking at drug elimination in terms of bioavailability and all that, how that factors into it. Remember the three main sites of drug elimination, either going to be just metabolism within the liver, elimination through the biliary tract, or elimination through the kidneys. So they're kind of the three big, big places you're going to see that. So how does Henderson Hasselbeck affect excretion? We've kind of mentioned that before. We are talking about that aspirin example. Remember that if things are in a more lipid-soluble form as they get filtered into the kidneys, is that going to increase their reabsorption or decrease it? It's more lipid-soluble there. It increases that reabsorption, right? So that extends the half-life because you're not going to be eliminating as fast. That clearance has gone down at those points there. Um, again, that's why you find things like weak bases tend to get excreted faster in acidic urine because it's more in the charged state, so it kind of bounces off those renal tubules versus weak acids. They're going to be more uh, excreted faster in the alkalotic urine. Remember, clinically, we use that to say uh, increase excretion of aspirin by giving the patient sodium bicarb. The bicarbonate gets excreted to the kidneys. That increases the pH of the urine. And thus, I'm going to have an easier time getting rid of that aspirin there, right? This is less lipophilic. Okay. Again, I talked about that example there using sodium bicarb. Uh, another example of a drug I can do that way is called phenobarbital. Have you ever heard of that before? It's kind of an old school uh, barbiturate. Uh, it is a sedative, hypnotic sort of agent. We use it for seizures. Um, we still use it as like the drug of choice for neonatal seizures. Um, but again, because it is a weak acid, um, by giving sodium bicarb, it can also increase elimination of that drug as well. You put the phenobarb into a state where it's going to be um, uh, more in the water-soluble form, less lipid-soluble, tends to get excreted a little bit faster there, right? If you ever have a patient come up and they say, oh, my peanut butter balls, chances are they're actually on phenobarbital. I had a patient who said that one time. <laughs> just, just be careful. Sometimes they mispronounce things, just like you guys will. Uh, for this whole year, I guarantee you. Um, the patient came up and said, can I get a refill of my CLA? Anyone know what that would be? KCL, yeah. I've actually heard that one before. KCL is just potassium chloride, right? So some patients are on that. Again, those are kind of funny things. Anywho, so let's kind of use an example here. Let's, let's look at a, a drug, uh, look how these different factors affect the bioavailability. We have propranolol, which is a beta blocker. And let's say we're going to be dosing that 160 milligrams, so one tablet, PO, which means by mouth, daily. Okay. And so let's look at the absorption of it. So propranolol is a weak base, and it's highly lipophilic. And it's a pK of about 9.4. So based off of this, do you think it would have good or bad absorption, say, in the stomach? Probably bad absorption in the stomach because we mentioned it's a weak base. And so as I start to drive that pH down closer to 2, you're going to find more of it's going to in that, be in that charged state. It's picked up that proton. It's positive. It would not absorb very well. However, if I dump it into the small intestine, now i got a lot of bicarb being secreted through the pancreas. Now pH has gone up. What happens to the bioavailability of that drug at that point? It's gone up. It's going to have a lot easier time being absorbed. So you'll find that most drugs tend to be absorbed easier within the small intestine. That's part of the uh, features of that. And again, getting it to a more lipophilic sort of form there. So we remember first pass effect. What is that? Yeah, so it has to get passed to the liver. That liver tax is going to take off some part of the drug. Depends on if it's a uh, if it has high first pass effect, it'll be a lot of it. If it has low first pass effect, it'll be very little of the drug. Just depends. Let's say for our purposes here, the propranolol has a first pass effect of approximately 25%. So based on that one dose of 160 milligrams, how much of it actually makes it into the circulation? 120 milligrams, right? 40 milligrams of that drug is already gone because it got metabolized within the liver. Okay? So you have to factor that in to consider how much the actual drug is getting into the, the circulation there. So 25% is already gone. Um, so 120 milligrams would be in actually, actually in the body itself to go to the site of action to block the beta receptors. Okay? Now let's say we have a half-life of approximately six hours for this drug here. Now based off of that, in six hours, what would be my amount of drug left in the body? Would be 80? How much of it actually make it to uh, circulation? All right, 120, right? So remember, 120 is actually in the body now. Let's say we give it six hours. Now we have how much left? 60 left, right? And then another half-life. 
be 30, right? So again, you can see by looking at this, um, considering what the, the half-life of the drug is, you're going to find that as it gets farther and farther, you're going to be metabolizing less and less drug because there's less of it to actually be metabolized. Now, is this an example of first order or zero order kinetics? First order kinetics here, right? Zero order would be if we were to saturate all those enzymes and we were metabolizing it too uh, slowly, you'd find it to be the constant amount of drug per unit of time there, right? So anyway, so, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I've been misspeaking this entire time. Um, I said 25% of the drug actually makes it into the systemic circulation. I misspoke on that last slide. Um, so instead of 160 milligrams, 120 making it in, only 40 milligrams were made in. That's why my numbers didn't make a whole lot of sense when I was looking at it. And I was trying to figure out why that was. That's the reason why I misspoke. So only 25% of it made through. So only 40 milligrams actually got into the circulation here. So again, it means that hour zero, we have 40 milligrams at six, now it's 20, et cetera, on down the line. So again, if you could just go back and zap the last, maybe like three minutes of your memory and just put in this part of it, okay? It's gonna be fantastic. But does that make sense of how the, the half-life is gonna go? Yes. Right, so that means that 24 hours, we only have basically two and a half milligrams of that original 40 milligrams left uh, originally, okay? So that means we have very little drug left, it means the effects are probably wearing off, and at that point we need to do what? You have another dose, right? And that's gonna then allow it to start to stack up and eventually we'll get to our steady state. Now based off of this, how long would it take to get to steady state? So four to five half-lives, between 24 and 30 hours or so, right? So a little over a day, and it should be at steady state. Assuming we're giving the same dose of drug, and we're going to be giving it the same dosing interval, whether it's Q12, Q8, whatever the case may be, okay? It doesn't matter what dose I'm giving. It doesn't matter what um, uh, interval I'm giving it. It's always four to five half-lives to get to that steady state, okay? It's one thing that's always going to be constant as long as you're in first-order kinetics. So um, looking at this, now we're going to talk about the distribution of the drug. Like, where is it actually going once it's in the body there? So we mentioned only 40 milligrams of that original uh, 160 makes into the circulation here. And now looking at this, you see that it's about 90% bound to plasma proteins. Specifically, this is one called alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, okay? Uh, what's another main serum protein that drugs like to bind to? Albumin is the other big one, but this one tends to uh, bind to, to alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. So 90% of it's bound. So that means what amount of the drug is free in circulation is able to interact with the receptors? Only 10%. So you have 10% of that 40 milligrams, and only about 4 milligrams is actually unbound. The other 36 is bounded by the proteins. Okay. So again, whatever's free is considered to be physiologically active. If it's bounded with the protein, it can't interact with those beta receptors. It can't really do anything. Okay, so that's one important uh, note there. Now, what would happen if I say were to get rid of some of that alpha-1 acid glycoprotein? Say a patient had either a deficiency of it uh, due to nutrition or whatever the case may be, what would happen to that free fraction there? It would increase, right? So maybe it goes from 10%, say, to 20%. What does that do to the effect of the drug? It doubles, right? Because, again, in that case there, you'd have double the amount of drug that's free floating around interacting with the receptors, okay? So again, that, um, protein binding is really, really important. What do you think happens to the, uh, the volume of distribution of the drug as those protein stores go down? More of it's free means more of it can go out to the tissues, right? So again, as you lose some of those serum proteins, you're gonna find the distribution tends to go up as well for a lot of those medications there, okay? More proteins around if it binds to the drug means it's gonna have a lower volume of distribution. Getting rid of those proteins will increase it, okay? So let's say, for instance, we have a prototypical sort of 70 kilogram male here, and let's say we're to give him 160 milligrams of the drug. We know that due to first pass, we're going to lose about 75% of that drug, meaning we only have about 40 left over. Now, after that dose, we went ahead and took a blood sample from that patient and got a level of 0.14 milligrams per liter. So based off of this, could you determine what the patient's volume distribution is? We absolutely can, right? You may not want to do that, but I'm going to tell you we can do that. Because um, you have to go back to that, that uh, formula we talked about, is that C0 equals dose over volume of distribution, right? And again, I'm not going to have you calculate this specifically on the exam, but what I want you to know is that by changing these variables, how does that affect things like the dose? How does that uh, affect the concentration, et cetera? So let's try to sub in and figure out what the volume of distribution is uh, for this particular patient here, okay? So we have our C0. And we know that what our dose is, and now we're just trying to solve for VD. By flipping that around, using our algebra skills, we know that VD, and again, how is that usually measured? In liters, right, it's a volume, uh, is going to equal the dose over C0. So basically, what would I need to do? Basically, I'll take that 40 milligrams that actually made it through, and then divide it by 0.14. Anyone have a calculator available? 
No one at all. It's almost like no one has a computer in front of them. Strange. <laughs> let's say let's take that 40, divide it by 0. 0.14. 285 liters. Okay, so that means 285 liters. So what if I wanted to say apply that to another patient? What could I do? Well, I could take out the weight of the patient and then apply that to someone else. So how would I do that? Well, I would just divide that 285 by 70 kilograms. Right? How much does the patient weigh? 70 kilograms. So if I did that, you get 4 liters per kilograms. So then if I say we were to treat a patient with uh, had a, weighed 50 kilograms, I can then multiply that and figure out what their volume distribution is. Okay? So that's the nice thing. When you look up drug con or you look up the kinetics of these drugs, very frequently they'll say, hey, so this many liters per kilogram. Then you apply that to your patient's weight, and then you know what their specific volume distribution is, right? So again, that 285 was the patient-specific volume distribution. By taking their weight out of it, now you get a more kind of general volume distribution. For the dose, we're using the uh, circulating dose, not the... Yeah, we're going to use that circulating dose there, right? Because that's what's available. Uh, that's what actually made it to the circulation there. Yeah, so again, if on a test question, I just said, you know, you gave 40 milligrams intravenously, and you know the bioavailability of that is what? 100%, right? So you could just take that number in and of itself. Now, again, I'm not going to get that complicated on the test for sure, but again, know how these factors matter. So, for instance, if I said, hey, you had a really obese patient, they had a lot of adipose tissue, how's that going to affect the volume of distribution here? It's going to go up. Remember that the cutoff point I said between drugs have a low and a high volume of distribution? What was the number? One liter per kilogram, right? You said this is four, so does it mean this is pretty lipophilic? Yeah, it has a high volume of distribution, right? So that means that it likes to go into the tissue. So if I had a patient with a lot of adipose tissue, what would that do to the volume of distribution? It would increase, right? What does that do to my C0? It decreases, right? See, these relationships have to be kept in mind because you have to know how it's going to affect your concentration. Now, if I have all of those uh, propranolols distributing out to the fat tissue, where does that drug normally work? The beta blocker. Works on the heart. So if that's in the tissue, it's not working on the heart there. So you have to know what those concentrations are because that's what's going to actually be physiologically active, right? So this is why this stuff actually matters. Again, you can do the uh, the math is here, so you can kind of go through that and work through it. But again, remember, this is the, the number that I can actually go and apply to other patients. And I think I double-checked this on Lexicom, so if I'm wrong, you can point it out. But I think this is correct uh, to the actual values of the drug itself. Everyone with me so far? See some head scratching, that's a good sign. Means your brain's working, right? Okay. Now let's say for instance we had a 50 kilogram female and we want to give a dose of 120 milligrams. We know what our volume of distribution is. Let's estimate what her plasma concentration would be. Okay. How do we do that? How do we go about doing that? Yeah, I don't remember if I put it on the next slide or not. I did put it on the next slide. Fantastic. Okay, so basically what we can do is we're going to find what our estimated C0 is, is going to be equal to the dose that we administer, or the dose that's actually going to be circulating, divided by the volume of distribution. Now, we gave 120 milligrams orally, so that means what made it through to the circulation? Only 25%, which is 30 milligrams of that original 120. Okay, so 30 milligrams is going to be our dose here. Okay, this is then going to be divided by the volume of distribution, which is what? It's so a four liters per kilogram times the patient's weight, which is 50. So four kilograms, per, sorry, this should say liters per kilogram, I apologize. Four liters per kilogram times 50 or 200, right? So for that patient, I could say, okay, well, 30 divided by 200. I could say, okay, your level would be 0.15. And then I would compare that to a therapeutic level range. And I'd say, okay, this looks like it's the right in range. This is a good dose for you. Or it's too much or it's too little, depending on, on the case there. Okay. So the... Um, the bioavailability, yes. You typically will find that, hey, you know, it's roughly 25% bioavailable, right? Changes for different drugs? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, because again, first pass effect might be really high for this particular drug, but really low for other drugs, right? So again, this took 75% off of the drug right off the bat. But it also means that what do you think What do you think a normal, like, say, IV dose of propranolol might be compared to the oral dose? A lot less or a lot more? A lot less because, again, you don't have to worry about the, the first pass effect. It's just going straight into the system. So if you were to give, say, a normal oral dose IV, you would probably harm the patient, right? Because, again, you have way too much drug around because uh, you did not take into account that bioavailability. Some drugs is one-to-one -one between the two. Uh, oftentimes it is not the case, okay? 
And again, I do this very frequently when I'm having patients who um, are taking narrow therapeutics and index drugs. I'll say, okay, well, you weigh this much. I know the drug has this volume of distribution. How much do I need to give you to get to my desired concentration, right? That way I'm kind of prospectively dosing the medication to make sure it's efficacious and hopefully avoiding toxicity, okay? It's really important for antibiotics and other drugs like that. Okay. Anyhow, all right, so putting all together, let's say we have a new drug. We have sarcastinol. Let's take your excessive sarcasm, right? Um, let's say it has, it's a weak acid, has a pKa of 5.4, has a bioavailability of about 90%. So 90% of it actually makes it through. And it has a volume distribution of 0.2 liters per kilogram. So based off of that, is that low or high volume distribution? Low, because it's less than one, which means is it probably lipophilic or hydrophilic? Pretty hydrophilic for the most part, right? We're going to dose it at 500 milligrams every six hours, okay? Just kind of keep these things in mind here. Let's say after a 500 milligram dose, how much of it actually gets absorbed into the systemic circulation? 450 milligrams, right? Because it says 90% bioavailable. So you take 10% of that off, right? So 450 milligram gets it in. And then what effect do you think taking Tums, which is a base, would have on its absorption? Why would it decrease it? So if you said it's a weak acid, as I'm increasing the pH, you're going to find it's going to be in a more basic medium and have a harder time getting absorbed because it tends to lower that lipophilicity. Okay? So again, there's already interactions we can start to see pretty frequently pop up with uh, antacids and, and other things like that. So um, looking at this, what would be the expected serum concentration after a 450 milligram dose in a 70 kilo male? So I said, all right, well, knowing my relationships in this, these variables here, C0 equals dose over VD, right? So I said our dose is going to be what? 450, because again, we're giving it as a, uh, that 90% bioavailable dose, 500 milligrams, sounds 450, and divided by the volume distribution of 70 times what? 0.2, right? So 70 times 0.2 is? 14. So we take 450 divided by 14. What do you get? 450 divided by, what did I say? 14. And you get 32. So I'd expect that patient's concentration to be 32 milligrams per liter. Now, again, remember, why is that so much higher than the concentrations we were talking about with propranolol? The volume distribution, right? Because, again, this is low volume distribution, so more of it's sitting there in the bloodstream, and not a lot of it has to partition out to the tissue. That's why you see those concentrations so much higher on the blood for something like this. Okay? So, again, the volume distribution was a big factor there and why those concentrations are different. Everyone with me? Any questions on, on that stuff? So again, you may think like, when are we ever going to do this? And hopefully if you're lucky enough to work in a hospital where you can just say pharmacy to dose, it's your three favorite words because that means you can shove it off to someone else to do the work for you. But sometimes you work in places where you have to do it yourself, and this is where these factors really come into play here, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, does liver function patient to patient determine first half effect as well? Yes. Uh, if you had a patient who had poor hepatic function, you would find that may diminish, uh, that would actually lower the first pass effect. So more of it might actually get through. Okay. So you may give like a standard dose to a patient, or a standard oral dose, and you're like, man, why is it causing so many side effects? Why is the level so high, or what the case may be? And it could be because they're not metabolizing enough of it on that first pass uh, through. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Let me check the sticky board real quick before everyone packs up and leaves. Oh my goodness, so many questions. I like it. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, let's see. Is latanoprost or travoprost the same as bimatoprost? They're all in the same family of prostaglandins. So oftentimes, and this is kind of sometimes nice, sometimes not nice with drug names, is when you're trying to memorize the, the hundreds and hundreds of drugs you're going to learn with me, and yes, it will be hundreds, um, you're going to find that if you can find commonalities between the names, that will help in order to uh, know what class a drug will belong to. Right? So if you see a prost at the end of the name, even if it's not something used for glaucoma, but maybe something else, you know it's going to be a prostaglandin, right? You already know a lot about that drug based off of just knowing what class it falls into, right? Or if I, uh, for instance, if I see um, uh, for beta blockers, you'll oftentimes see LOL at the end of the name, right? So it's metoprolol, propranolol, carvedilol. You'll see that. And so, again, knowing those kind of associations will help in your mind memorize a little bit easier, okay? Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Is it true that some people are not actually allergic to penicillin? It was due to impurity that penicillin was first manufactured. Yeah, that's really interesting. So it's more to do with impurities. Uh, so anyone know how we used to make penicillin? We used to get molds to do it for us, right? So again, some of you may have penicillin in your fridges right now. You don't even know, right? Just, just All right. Um, 
Anywho, though, so again, uh, there's a there's there's penicillins as an antibiotic class, and there's cephalosporins. It's another really common one. Has anyone ever heard of like rocephin yeah. or septinir? Like those are cephalosporins, and they're kind of structurally very similar to one another. And so we used to think that there was a lot of cross reactivity in those allergies. So if you had a penicillin allergy, you couldn't get any cephalosporin. The reason why we thought that for so long is because originally these molds that were making it actually were cross contaminating the products. Nowadays, we have synthetic means of making it. We don't have to worry about that cross-reactivity. Um, but yeah, a lot of it had to do with the impurities that were in those uh, kind of earlier, more sort of barbaric sort of manufacturing processes. Not really barbaric, but it's kind of old school. Anyway, um, let's see. Examples of common enzyme inducers that may decrease effectiveness of oral contraceptives. Whether for personal use or not, I have no idea. Uh, a lot of uh, anti-epileptics actually do this. A lot of seizure medications, um, things like phenytoin, uh, things like carbamazepine can actually lower levels of oral contraceptives. Um, kind of the, the bad thing about that is, is a lot of those drugs tend to be used as mood stabilizers for patients with bipolar disorder. And one thing you learn about patients with bipolar disorder is that they always make good decisions especially in their manic phases, some of them tend not to, right? And they have things like high-risk sexual behaviors. And guess what? If they had that interaction there, they may get pregnant, which would be bad. So um, there's something to know with that. Let's see. Um, do I think there's aliens in Area 51? Probably not, but there's probably aliens somewhere. So I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? I think that was it. All right, if not, I'll see you guys next time.